God together, to be involved in an opportunity to sing praises and to engage in prayer to God, and to open from his word. And I invite you to open to Matthew chapter 4, where we're going to begin our study in just a moment. We'll get back to John chapter 21 in just a couple of moments. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for your interest in spiritual things and for the work that you're doing here in Kaysville. If you're visiting with the church here in Kaysville like I am visiting, a warm welcome to you. We're thankful for you taking the time to come and be a part of this service and worshiping God together. There are a number of things that as preachers we really like to see and we really like to hear. One of those is we love to hear the sound of pages turning in Bibles, and I'm confident that you will follow along today. The other thing, and unfortunately that will not be the case today, is we love to hear the sound of babies making noises in the audience. Um, and I just it's unfortunate that that's not going to happen today at any point. That is actually a good sign. Uh, someone was saying just a couple of days ago that a church where there are no babies who cry is a church that is soon going to die. And I think that there's some great truth to that. So for those of you who are fathers and mothers, grandparents who are here today struggling with children, trying to keep them either awake or maybe trying to keep them asleep, as the case may be, we are thankful for you and for your efforts. If you are older than an infant, then please do not sleep. You are not allowed to do that today. In the course of our time together, we want to study with eyes wide open, with ears that are ready to hear the truth, not because anything that I say is necessarily important, but because what I say from the scriptures is indeed very, very important. I want to talk about an uncommon follow me and why it's so uncommon as to what Jesus said in John chapter 21. And we'll go back and look at that passage here in more detail this morning in our study. But I want us to address what we mean by the nature of what is so uncommon about follow me. Because we, as good Bible students, know that Jesus has routinely said to those who were either thinking about following him or maybe were completely strangers to the mission of Jesus Christ, that indeed, I want you to follow me. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 19, we find where Jesus says very famously, and for the first time as is recorded in Scripture, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And that, of course, is something that we use today. As evangelists, as all of us are trying to teach and spread the truth, we are trying to get people to follow Jesus as well. In Matthew chapter 8, just a page or so over in your Bibles, in verse 22, Jesus would say to those individuals who had a lack of conviction in following him, he said, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Just a chapter over in Matthew chapter 9, in verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man by the name of Matthew who would, of course, be the future apostle and the author of the book that bears his name. And he says to him, follow me. And Matthew arose and followed him. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, we find where, again, Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And finally, in Matthew chapter 19, in verse 21, we find where the text records the following statement by our Savior. If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. So the notion of Jesus saying, follow me, is not a surprise to anyone. It's something that we can appreciate very much, and something that we understand a great deal. But I want us to appreciate that in John chapter 21, where we're going to focus our attention this morning, that indeed, Jesus, when he says, follow me to Peter, is an uncommon follow me. Because whether you are familiar with this or not, Jesus' statement to Peter in John chapter 21 is the only time that he says, follow me post-death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus throughout his lifetime says, follow me an awful lot. But this is the only time as is recorded in scripture where he says, follow me 
to an individual, and it serves as a reminder to us to know a number of things. I want us to note three things today that we should know about what it means to follow Jesus. This was true in the first century. It is true in the 21st century, and it will be true in every century that comes hereafter. I want us to first of all notice that we should know that there is a price that is involved in following Jesus. Following Jesus is not something that is free. You know, as a former teacher of economics, I taught high school for a number of years, and I taught economics, nothing is free. And that was one of the key rules that we would stress. Nothing is free in life. And it was always great to engage students in that kind of an argument. They said, well, I know a lot of things that are free. And then to prove to them that there's really nothing that is free. But the fact of the matter is, is there is a price that is involved when it comes to following Jesus, considering the fact that nothing is free. Throughout this text, Jesus is making certain that the Apostle Peter knows what's involved in service to him. So we're going to go back to John chapter 21 and look at some passages here in what our good brother read for us just a moment or two ago. We need to acknowledge that the act of feeding was costly. I would argue that this is a passage that is important for all individuals, but I would also argue that this is a very important passage for shepherds of a local church to make sure that they have a handle on, because what Jesus is asking Peter to do, a future elder of a local church, is what he is asking local pastors to do in churches today, and for that matter, in many ways, to do things that you and I, as members of the Lord's church, are being asked to do. I'm convinced that when he says, I want you to feed my sheep, that I want you to tend my sheep, I'm convinced that he was, in fact, talking to a degree about his future work as an elder. But I also am convinced that he's talking to all of us because it's everyone's job to teach. I've had a number of different discussions uh, with your shepherds as well as with members of this church over the last 48 hours. And one of the things that we've talked about a lot is the work that we have to do in this community and in any community where you might live in sharing the gospel with the lost. That's what the gospel message is. It's good news for others to appreciate and for others to know. We want to convert people to Jesus Christ. We don't want to convert them to the preacher. We don't want to convert them to a denomination. We want them converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's everyone's job. That's your job. That's my job. And we are all in this together. What is also interesting about this particular text is that Jesus used two different words for feeding. And this is not so much an expository sermon on John chapter 21 as it is so much an understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. But I do want us to note a couple of things about the text itself. In verse 15, he says, Simon, do you love me more than these? And we'll talk about what the these is here in just a second. But he says, you know, Lord, that I love you. And he said to him, I want you to feed my lambs. That word that he uses there is the idea of keeping or providing for food, which is a key responsibility of pastors in a local church, and in many ways is the responsibility of each of us in trying to share the gospel message with others. Notice that he says, I want you to feed my lambs. Whereas in verse 16, he talks about feeding or tending my sheep. He uses two different words to describe the subjects to which are being focused on, on the occasion. These are the newer or the younger saints. And this is a church that has a lot of excitement to it in that over the course of the next 5 and 10 and 15 years, you are going to have a lot of teenage Christians. At least we hope that they will grow up and dedicate themselves to Christ by being baptized for the salvation that they want and that 
God has blessed us with. The fact is, is you are blessed richly that you have, uh, up until yesterday, I think it was up until yesterday, 52. Now you are at 53. And any moment now, I think it's supposed to be 54 or 55. Um, it's a good thing that you have a digital directory because you guys would go broke printing directory updates with all of the children that you have being born. And that is an exciting thing for this church here. But the newer or the younger saints need particular attention. And that's, important. that's one of the reasons why Bible classes are so very important to have today. It is true that the church is not responsible solely for teaching young people. Broadcast message, if you as a young person, as a young parent, are only allowing Bible classes to be the, the focus of your children's learning, then you're not doing it the right way. You've got to engage in allowing them to see from you in the way that you live, in private Bible studies in your home, as to what good living is all about. But he says in verse 16, he says, feed or tend my sheep, which is to protect or rule, talking about both younger and older saints. The fact is, is Jesus was using this occasion to speak to Peter that his future freedom and his life would be in the hands of others. And we know from secular history that it is likely that Peter, much like the rest of the apostles, would have a violent exit to this life. Historians tell us that he died by crucifixion as well as his Savior did. But the fact is, is we should know that there is a price to following Jesus. Which brings me back to verse 15. Jesus says, Simon, do you love me more than these? And the question is, what was or who was the these? Some have suggested that Jesus is referencing the other disciples. That he's saying, do you love me more than the other disciples that are out there? And maybe that's what he means. If you're looking for a conclusive answer from me, you're not going to find it because I'm not exactly sure what the these are. I think it could be that it's possible that Jesus left it blank for a purpose that we'll get into here in about 30 seconds. But I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that Jesus may have been referring to the, the physical instruments of his profession, the instruments of his work in being a fisherman and the nets and the various things that were required. He says, do you love me more than these things? I'm convinced that there may be ambiguity tied to the these for a purpose purposeful reason, and that is there are so many things that can, if we are not careful, that they will interfere with our spiritual welfare and our growth as Christians, and that could keep us from faithful service. Let me just share with you two or three very quickly. It is important that you have a job. It is important that all of us have occupations. And we live in a very expensive environment where it's difficult to pay the bills from time to time, and so it's good to have a job. In fact, Paul told Timothy that for someone who doesn't provide for, him, for himself or for his family, that he's worse than an unbeliever. So we understand the importance of work. But is it possible that your work can stand in the way of your faithful service to God? And the answer is, is, of course, yes, that is absolutely the case. What about your friends? Everyone loves having friends, and it's important to have friends and people that you can count on and people that you can rely on. But if your friends stand in between you and faithful service to God, they are not friends in the truest sense of the word. And then let me share one that you may not have thought of from time to time, and that is sometimes our family can stand in the way of faithful service. I remember years ago I was preaching for a small church in West Central Indiana, and, and this family is now gone from this life because they've passed away. But I remember on one particular occasion where uh, one particular sister was missing from services, and I just asked, where was Sister Smith today? And the answer was, well, she's home. I thought, well, she's sick. No, she's not sick. She's cooking. I said, well, what's she cooking for? She's cooking for family, coming in today. And I had to scratch my head and think about where that person's priorities was lying because is family more important 
or is the Lord more important? And it's true that we all have to make sacrifices and difficult choices from time to time, and sometimes we have to make judgment calls. But I thought that it was interesting that we need to understand that serving Jesus Christ isn't free, that it does require sacrifice on our part, and that we should know the price. Secondly, we should know that there is love associated with service to Jesus Christ. The New Testament, on so many occasions, teaches that love and service go hand in hand. We don't have the time to go back and read 1 John chapter 3 and chapter 4, but you know that John is the apostle of love. That's his nickname because he speaks about love so frequently. I just finished in Lake Elsinore a 20-lesson series on 1 John. John. It took five months to work through 1 John. But one of the things that we discovered in our study of 1 John is that there John the apostle and the friend of Jesus routinely talks about the fact that God loves us and he loves you. And as a result, we are responsible for loving others. And that is not only our responsibility, but is also our privilege. Jesus would routinely ask Peter about his love of him. And why was that the case? Why was Jesus asking, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? On this occasion where he would say, follow me. Well, I'm convinced that Jesus knew that if Peter truly loved Jesus the Christ, then he would automatically love the brethren, or that we would love the brethren, and others in general, including those who are not saved. Our mission is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And I appreciate the theme that the shepherds have set out for 2019, that as a part of that is going out and showing the gospel message to others, both in the words that you use and the things that you say and sometimes in the things that you don't say, or as we talked about in our Bible class this morning, sometimes the things that we refrain from doing. But that is our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ. This reminds me of an older gentleman for whom I have immense respect. He's about 90 years old and he's going on about 40. Don't you just, don't those people just drive you crazy who they are healthier than you and they are twice or two and a half times your age and they don't have any ailments, they don't have any difficulties, no pains, nothing like that? Well, Jack is like that. And I remember talking to Jack, who's preached now for 65, 70 years, and I remember talking to him at one point and he had stopped to help someone who was helpless or homeless or without food or whatever. And I just asked him, I said, well, well what made you do that? What, what drove you to help that particular person? And I remembered that it was so important that I wrote it down. And he said, Jesus died for him. I don't know much about him, but I know that Jesus died for him. And I was like, wow, that's impressive because he loves the brethren, because he loves people in general. But then what about the back and forth over love? Because this is a frustrating passage. It's not only frustrating to study because it's kind of difficult to figure out some of the language that is being used. We'll talk about that in just about 20 seconds. But it's also frustrating because you can see the angst on the part of Peter saying, you know that I love you, Jesus, but Jesus keeps asking. Jesus, as you, as good Bible students, and I've been told about some of the great Bible students who are here in Kaysville, and that's wonderful. Jesus, of course, uses the term agape. He uses that love that is rich, that is meaningful, that is full. That is the idea that whether you love me or not, I'm going to love you. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for us, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, and that he loved us that much. The fact of the matter is, is Jesus says, do you love me that much, Peter? Do you love me to that degree? And then Peter answers back almost timidly. And we lose this in the English language. And he says, yes, I love you. But he uses a different term. It's not quite the same, but it's like Jesus saying, 
do you really love me? And then Peter says, I love you. And then Jesus says, do you really love me? And then Peter answers back and he says, I love you. And you can see the frustration on the part of the Savior in what he's trying to get Peter to understand here. After all, Peter has a personality that maybe needs some more exploration. It's interesting because when people talk about people of the Bible that they are like or unlike, I find it really interesting, almost comical, how often Peter will say, or people will say, I'm like Peter. And when they say that, they're talking about themselves in not flattering terms. I, I'm impetuous, I'm impatient, I say things without thinking. Until the third time, that is. What was Peter doing by saying, I love you, but not saying, I really love you? Was Peter suggesting a reserved love for Jesus? Or was Peter checking himself? Because we have to remember that Peter has had a history of not thinking things through and saying things that he comes back to regret. Perhaps his humility is in focus now more than it has ever been before. And one other thing that you've probably already noticed, but if you would note how many times Jesus asks, do you love me? Three. Three is a good, nice number for biblical completion. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But you as good Bible students know the story that on three occasions, just hours before, or just days before, that Jesus had been denied by Peter, not once, not twice, but three times. And so now Jesus comes back and says, Peter, I've got a question for you. And I'm going to ask it three times. Peter, does that remind you of anything? Jesus may be thinking. The fact is, is we should know the love that is associated with following Jesus. And finally, we should know forgiveness. Consider, if you would, the context of this event. Peter, as we said just a moment or so ago, had denied Jesus in a very big and public way. The fact is, is in chapters 20 and 21, they had spent a fair amount of time together. So this is unlikely that this is the first dialogue between Peter and Jesus. But for whatever reason, maybe Peter and Jesus hadn't spoken before this particular event. And after all this was said and done, Peter hears two words that I'm convinced must have sounded great to him. After all, Peter feels bad about himself. He has a right to feel bad about himself for what he has done, what he has said, for that horrible denial of the Savior, his friend, and the master teacher. But there, in John chapter 21, signifying by what death he would glorify God, and when he had spoken this, Jesus said to Peter, in verse 19, he said, follow me. It's interesting that the same thing that Jesus would use to launch the kingdom by getting people to follow him is now the same tool that he uses in getting someone who has gotten off track to follow him. The fact of the matter is, is Peter must have thought, this is what he said to me before I sinned. He's telling me the same thing now after I have sinned. Why is that so important? Because Jesus forgives. This is not merely a reminder to Peter of Christ's love, but I'm convinced it's an occasion to remind Peter to forgive others as he goes about feeding them. And as local elders could say in this church or in any church where they are present and where they are shepherding, forgiving is part of the key work in which they are doing. Because members will do things that are wrong, do things that they ought not, 
and they need forgiveness. And Peter needs to understand that to whom much is given, much is expected. And great forgiveness is granted to Peter such that he has the responsibility of showing that love to others. I love this follow me. I love those two words because the follow me is, I believe, uncommon. Because again, where we started and where we end, it's the only time in the New Testament where Jesus says, follow me to someone after his resurrection. Jesus' forgiveness is uncommon, and we ought to take advantage of it. And I think that's the broad message of John chapter 21. There's so much that we could say about the text itself, but this is where Jesus is saying to individuals, regardless of the mistakes in your past, I can forgive you, I will forgive you, if you live for me. And that's the great message that we can share with others, and I would encourage you to share with others. And maybe to get very literal and very pragmatic, simply tell someone this week, follow me to church, follow me to Jesus, follow me to the Bible, follow me with understanding what the scriptures teach about salvation. And that is, of course, the responsibility and the privilege of each of us. If you're not following Jesus, then you need to follow Jesus. And it's possible that there is one here this morning, if not more, that has never been baptized to have his or her sins washed away. And we want you to make the correction today to live for Jesus and to follow him. If that's something that you are ready to do today, we would welcome the opportunity to help you. If as a child of God you are living in sin and you are not doing what God has asked you to do and you need to make some sort of correction, this is a group of Christians that is concerned about you and that will pray for you. I have no doubt of that. If we can help or encourage you in any way, let us know while together we stand and sing.